This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. We're coming to you from the DraftKings.com podcasting studios. DraftKings.com, America's one-day fantasy sports site, where it's like a new season every time you play. DraftKings.com. From ESPN's Pod Center, this is NBA Lockdown. Welcome to a special edition of the NBA Lockdown Podcast. I am Amino Hassan. I'm joined by my NBA front office insider colleague, Kevin Pelton. We'll be joined by Tom Penn shortly. Uh, Kevin, we're out here in Las Vegas. I believe we're in the same hotel, and yet we're not in the same room right now. Is this uh, kind of confusing you right now that we have to speak on the phone even though we're in the same hotel? <laughs> it's throwing me off a little bit, but, you know, your hate heart is so strong that I, I don't think that uh, I could be in the same room with that presence. <laughs> well, I appreciate your reverence for the hate heart. Kevin, it's day five of Summer League. We've witnessed the first four days. Uh, let's start with actually, let's take it a step back and think about what does Summer League mean to you as from a front office perspective, from an evaluation perspective? Well, I think it depends on the type of player you're evaluating. To me, it's most meaningful for rookies, uh, guys that we just don't know how their games are going to translate to the NBA in the first place. And in some ways, this is more relevant than what we saw them do in college or even internationally. So, you know, it is it is important for those guys. Uh, when I studied this a couple of years ago for ESPN Insider, I found that there was a, a pretty strong predictive power, about one-third as strong as what guys had done in college uh, when you had, had stats available for those players uh, in terms of what they would do during their rookie NBA seasons. For veterans, there's not as much predictive power, and to me, you're most looking for it's it's a skill thing. Um, with guys who are trying to make it in the league, do they have an NBA skill that you can fit onto a roster? And with guys who are you know established second year players who were drafted in the first round last year, it's all about you know show me something that you didn't do as a rookie, show me how you've expanded your game, or what you can work on here because there's no pressure of winning or losing. Breaking news. Oh, sad news is broken. Breaking news. Oh, man. That drop there can only mean one thing. We are joined by the one, the only, Tom Penn, the GM of NBA Front Office Insider here at ESPN.com. Tom, what's going on? What's happening, guys? Nothing much. We're just talking a little summer league. Uh, I just got done asking Kevin uh, what, if anything, can we glean from Summer League as meaningful? And so I'll pose it to you. Uh, when you're here at Summer League and, you know, beyond, obviously, the networking that we all do when we're out here, just in terms of the product on the court, what what are you looking for and what, what do you take away? You're looking for flashes of NBA brilliance, you know, some NBA demonstration of skills that's going to translate. You know, Kevin's right. The higher the draft pick, the more scrutiny there is on this as a rookie. And when you take somebody second in the draft, you sort of expect them to come in and at some point in this process do something impressive, right? I mean, you want to see it. Fact, LaMarcus Aldridge, Brandon Roy, you know, Greg Oden in my years in Portland, you, you come here with a lot riding on it you know, in, in your own mind, because your owner's watching, your fans are watching, and you're frankly watching. And, you know, it's interesting with a player like Moutier, who none of these front offices really got the chance to see much this year. Uh, it Does it matter a bunch? No. But it's all you got. And so, the, so it does matter. And then you just uh, react to what you see. And so a lot of this is about these players getting comfortable and getting confident because they're not comfortable and they're not confident. How could they be? Um, and the only thing that breeds comfort and confidence is performance. And so if you lay an egg through all of summer league, you go through the rest of the summer with that doubt. The, the player's doubting himself. The coaches are like, oh, my God, we make a disastrous pick here or what? And the executives get in a position where they have to defend things a little bit. Um, so, you know, in that context, it is important that somebody performs, especially if they're a high draft pick. 
Yeah, it's funny that you should bring that up because we saw that yesterday with the Lakers, uh, who had a starting lineup pretty much of all guys who will be on the roster come uh, opening of camp. And uh, D'Angelo Russell, the number two overall pick, had eight turnovers to one assist. Jordan Clarkson, who was a breakout player for them last season, shot three for 14. Uh, Julius Randle was two for eight. And so is this something that, you know, they, is this something in your guys' opinion that is indicative of uh, some sort of struggle to adjust? Or are we just, you know, was it just a bad night and is everyone overreacting? Let's go Tom first and then Kevin. Well, you know, one game in the summer league, you put any game under a microscope, you're going to see sloppy turnovers. These guys aren't used to playing with each other. The talent level's lower. Um, you know, I, I think you chalk it up as one bad night and no big deal, unless you put a string of these together. And then, as we talked about, then it's challenging. Um, or it can become challenging. So I wouldn't get too hung up on the, the egg that they laid last night. You know, it's interesting, though. There's 12,000 fans here, most of them Laker fans. Of course, they booed them off the floor when they only scored <laughs> five points in the first quarter, 66 for the game. I mean, you know, but we've all seen that. You see that with the good teams, with the bad teams in summer league. You know, some of these kids only play 18 minutes. You know, the coaches are managing minutes a little bit. Um, as I say, it really doesn't matter in the big scheme of things, but it sure makes a difference for this week and the rest of the summer. I, I think to Tom's point, you know, part of what happens with, you know, people see, oh, these summer league stats aren't that meaningful. It's not just because of the fact that, you know, the games are different and, you know, it's so much of a guards league and you haven't practiced together and that, that sort of thing. But it's also because you only are playing four or five games. So, you know, if you have one bad night out of 82, that's going to even out. It might not even out here. Uh, I, I, so I think, you know, Clarkson has been good over the course of the week. No no real concern there for me that he struggled last night. Julius Randle, I'm still not seeing him, you know, evolve in obviously in the half court. He did a lot more playmaking in, in transition yesterday, grabbing the rebound and starting the fast break, which is – so that I can think, I think can be a real plus for him, but uh, you know needs to to be more creative basically in the half court where he's always going left and always going to that spin move after facing guys up, and then Russell, you know the shooting not too worried about. He, he actually shot the ball decently last night. Uh, the turnovers. A little bit of a concern. I mean, I think you want him to try to make plays like that in summer league. And, you know, there's some evidence. This doesn't appear to be as true with point guards, but I found some evidence in the past that turnovers for rookies are actually a slightly positive indicator because it means that you're, you're, you see the play. You might not be able to execute it yet, but a couple of years down the road, you might be able to execute it. And that's what I see with D'Angelo Russell right now. My concern with last night with both of those guys was just the stat line of only seven shot attempts and eight shot attempts, respectively, for Russell Randall. You know, you want to get as many sort of touches and shot attempts as possible on it, uh, in the grand scheme of things. Now, if you're turning the ball over, uh, nobody's getting a shot attempt. But, um, you know, it's hard to nitpick one summer game like this. Uh, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum uh, we have guys who come to summer league unheralded and walk out with uh, with NBA deals. We saw Willie Reed sign a one-year deal. We saw Jonathan Simmons coming out of nowhere and getting a guaranteed deal with the Spurs. Uh, and there's a precedent for this, obviously, you know, a few years back. Gary Neal, unknown guy, played a thousand, went to Europe, had a couple of nondescript years, comes to the uh, Spurs summer league team ends up going to camp and is now a bona fide NBA player. And uh, I, I just want to ask Tom, what is it, you know, what are you looking for as far as guys like that? Guys who, by all, you know, measures should not be anything more than summer league fodder. What, what do, do they show that has to go to, hey, maybe this is a guy who can stick around with the real team? Well, first off, any of these teams like the Spurs who went into free agency and spent their free agency money, all they have left to spend is minimum salary contracts. So they need to add one of two things, a veteran who can help right now and a young player who can help 
and or be a great practice player and a rotation guy and somebody you can build on. So what you're looking for is the plug-and-play needs that you have. Um, you know, and the better the team, the more specific the needs. But all great teams need shooting. They need perimeter defenders and help, you know, energy defenders, and they need size with energy. You know, those three things uh, automatically translate, and the better the team gets, the more they want them. So, uh, you know, you've done your homework on all these players. You know them. Some of them are, you know, fourth-year guys who have been who have been percolating and evolving over in Europe, and now they're back here. And you say, okay, that's a different cat than I saw before. He's got a level of professionalism now. He's demonstrating one of those skills I just talked about. Let's get him and let's bring him. And, you know, when you gut your roster to go get LaMarcus Aldridge or do whatever these other teams have done with major cap room, you need bodies, right? You need players. So it's almost just as competitive to get the right fringe guys as it is uh, to get uh, some of the glamour players, Kevin, how how indicative are summer league stats for for the fringe players? You know, not for the guys that we expect to be on the roster, but these guys that you know, for one reason or another, blow us away. I guess with their play. You know, I didn't look specifically at them. It was, I just put it into rookies and veterans. But uh, I, I think some of the same things that apply in terms of, you know, you can get fooled by his hot shooting performance. Uh, Josh Selby wasn't necessarily in this position a couple of years ago when he won Summer League MVP, but, you know, a guy who had yet to establish himself in the league and was trying to make it and didn't, you know, that didn't translate at all because of the fact that he shot like 55% from three in those four or five games, and, you know, that wasn't something he was ever going to be able to sustain come the regular season. But, you know, I think if you see a guy uh, defensively making an impact, a, a lot of steals and blocks on the defensive glass, that's more likely to be the kind of role player where the performance in, in Las Vegas is going to translate directly over to the to the NBA. You know, another thing uh, about these the fringe players, I'll call them, those get much more coach-specific. You know, you want the coach to make this selection and to sign off on it because the coach needs to believe in those guys and what they bring. So that's another element of summer league is you're able to sit here together with your coach sort of shoulder to shoulder and point your eyes on some specific guys playing on other teams. You know, you're going to come watch your own team, but you might bring your head coach over to, to glance at this guy, glance at that guy, and tell me what you think, how he will fit. And that's a, a unique opportunity that occurs at a combine like this. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite parts of Summer League is, is being able to sit as a staff. And, and it's really the rarest of occasions where you, know, as a front office guy, can be right next to your, your head coach or maybe even your lead assistant coach while the, kind of the younger coaches are, are running the team on the floor. Uh, so being able to evaluate that is, is, is a tremendous opportunity. But uh, speaking of that, speaking of younger personnel pretty much running the show, Tom, in, in Portland, uh, did you guys do that across the board? For, for instance, us in Phoenix, our head trainer didn't, was, didn't run the show. We had an assistant trainer run the show. Our head video guy would be on the bench, and our assistant video guy would be the guy cutting up stuff. So almost everybody took a step forward. Uh, in order to kind of get a feel for what that next position is. Do you guys do that in Portland? Yeah, at every level except management. Kevin Pritchard wouldn't step aside <laughs> for anything. <laughs> um, yeah, we did the same thing. We would uh, you, you sort of let everybody take a step up, handle certain things. As you said, the assistant trainer is sort of in charge of all the logistics along with uh, all the health and wellness. It gives you a little bit of a chance to experiment with different things, you know, in that health and sports science category. You might sample something or try something. It's a really short window of time, though. Um, although, you know, what we did in the years when we were really developing the whole team is we would go to multiple summer leagues. You know, we went to um, Utah, then to Vegas, you know, and, and you put them back to back, and it makes for a longer period of time together. Uh, but all these repetitions are critically important. You know, we talk about the games, but these days off are real practices. 
And then every day is real coaching sessions with your shooting coach or with your, you know, skill development coaches. And you, you can't buy that time, you know, because it's all collectively bargained for. You only get this limited window of time around a summer league if you're playing to get with the team and get more than three guys on the floor at a time. And that's it. And then you got to wait for training camp. And training camp comes and you get six days together. Can't even really do meaningful double sessions anymore. And then you're playing. So the learning curve is so steep. And the, the ability to get confidence and comfort and continuity is very limited. And it's going on right now. So that's why it's important. Yeah. One of, one of the great things, uh, you know, I, I've talked about this before. We draft a kid. Uh, we'd fly him in the day after the draft to do his intro press conference, shake hands, kiss babies. He'd fly home for the weekend to get stuff, and then he'd come back that Monday, and we would start working right then and there. And between that week or so or two weeks leading up to the Summer League, and then the 10 days or so we're at Summer League, and then uh, showing up early in August or you know late August or uh, to start getting work done, we'd get a more familiarized with our concepts, our terminology, everything, so that when he does get to camp, it's not brand new when we're discussing 21 Chase or, you know, uh, Fist Up Houston. He's already heard these terms. He knows the, the bare bones, and then he's getting on the floor. He, he gets to run with uh, maybe uh, with some vets. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, to that point, one of the things that I really enjoyed yesterday was finding out that the Timberwolves, had a shoot around, had a practice, and not only Andrew Wiggins participated, but Kevin Barnett was there. And I don't think I've ever heard of a, of a vet that old showing up to Summer League just to get a workout in. I mean, I was in the room. We were doing our Sports Center segments, and I look over my shoulder, and I couldn't believe it. Seeing Kevin Barnett in a Summer League outfit, like stretching <laughs> with the guys. And then through the entire shoot around and, and practice, like going one by one with his arm around Andrew Wiggins and then his sh leaning on Carl Anthony Towns and talking to Zach Levine, I was like, holy cow, Flip Saunders, I get it now. I see it, I get it. To have KG here as a teammate, not a coach, a teammate, who's going to be, you know, battling with these guys on the floor, to him to be committed to teaching them like that now was just, I, I still can't believe my eyes. It was awesome. Amazing stuff. Uh, along with Tom Penn and Kevin Pelton, I'm Amino Hassan. We'll be back with more of the NBA Lockdown Summer League special in one minute. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. <laughs> Back with the NBA Lockdown Summer League Special Podcast. I'm Amino Hassan. I'm joined by Tom Penn and Kevin Pelton. Uh, gentlemen, a guy that we mentioned earlier in passing, but uh, I want to take a little bit longer to talk about him. Moutier, Emmanuel Moutier, the mystery man of the draft. I, I guess to my eyes, and you may disagree, he's been the best player so far at Summer League uh, through, through three games. He's, he's impressed the most. And my question is, is that because we didn't know enough about him and now seeing him, seeing him live and in person, we're impressed? Or is he playing better than we actually expected him to play? Let's go Tom and then Kevin. I'm curious from Kevin first, just to sort of recap his production so far. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing that stands out to me with Moody so far in uh, some of like is how well he's been passing the ball. Uh, you know, 7.3 assists per game 
which is third among all players here behind a couple of guys, Larry Drew second and Tim Frazier, who you know have some professional experience uh, in the U.S. at least. Obviously, Moody does in China. But you know, nobody else is making plays among the rookie class for their teammates as well as Moody. And that, to me, is surprising because, you know, I watched him play last year at the Hoop Summit, Nike Hoop Summit in Portland, and I, I kind of was – split on him because he looked like this incredible athlete. He didn't show a lot of point guard instincts. And then, you know, his stats in China did suggest, okay, this guy is legitimately a point guard. But even still, I think compared to that, what he's shown in summer league is better passing ability. And that, to me, makes him a much better prospect. Yeah, this one's really interesting because of the lack, the super small sample size. You know, you just talked about one game at the Hoop Summit and couple practices leading up to it that's all we really got a chance to see and then he gets you know you take china for what it's worth but he gets hurt so this is one of these where i guarantee you this is the nba board of governors meetings going on today all the owners are here i guarantee you the five owners or what, what you know the guys who didn't pick him are saying oh, what about him you know, and wondering what about him and did we miss on him because he's stepping right in and producing for sure, but it's also just the way he's carrying himself, his presence, his body, his change of pace, his sort of overall command of the game. It's been really impressive. Um, it's all make believe. Summer leagues make believe, but you know, as we've <laughs> talked about, it's meaningful if it matters to them and to him. And a great, he's definitely the star of the summer league so far. How much of a factor is that, that he, that he does have professional experience versus coming from the collegiate ranks as it factors on the court? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I think the I don't, he didn't play much professionally over there. He spent time over there. You know, I'm sure he went through some unpleasant experiences, which gave him a chance to grow up. You know, he was outside of the American bubble or the bubble he would have been put in at at SMU on their campus. Um, so that'll, that'll sharpen you up pretty quickly. Uh, how that translates to readiness for summer league, I'm not sure it does. I just think, I just think he's got physical stature, he's got the ball in his hands, and he's feeling confident in making plays. Um, you know, we'll see if that lasts once he gets in a real NBA setting. I would say the one thing is, you know, some of these guys, they're playing against significantly older players. You've got 35-year-old Keith Bogan here, among others, for the first time. And that's not new for Moody. That's one thing that he did experience playing in China. Yeah, for, for what it's worth, I talked to the Nuggets, a couple of people with the Nuggets organization, and you know, they're incredibly high on him, obviously. The, the thing that they like the most is, again, his confidence and his poise out there. They feel like everything that he's good at are the things that you can't teach. You either have it or you don't. Um, and then all the things that he's not good at, you know, most notably, of course, the shooting, and he hasn't shot well from the perimeter so far. Uh, those are things they feel like they can, they can fix that. They can get in the gym and, 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 and get him better. Um, moving, moving on to the off the court, uh, this is something I think a lot of people don't get. Fans, maybe even some of our bosses at, you know, at the company that the most important part of Summer League is not what happens on the court. And, Tom, you are a world-class schmoozer. Uh, you put me in the shame. I want you to tell people what, what that scene is like here in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's cool. You know, everybody's here, number one. Every owner in the league is here today. They have a big meeting today. They were here last night. There was a big party for Rob Thorne. Uh, Longtime NBA executive, his retirement party. So you've got most general managers there. Rod's relationships run deep. Um, every head coach is here for the most part, and they're all relaxed, collegiate. A lot of conversation going on. Um, you know, you go with your to dinner with your staff, but you mix and mingle with everybody else. You watch as much basketball as you want to watch. You're still hunting deals. You know, I can remember working multiple free agent deals from the Mandalay Bay pool, you know, walking around on the phone, working it out with agents on the phone, and then in person with, uh, you know, our executive team, and then signing the deals in the business center. 
You know, so that stuff still can be going on. Um, there can be trade talk, and then there's a whole lot of just chatter about evaluating what's going on. All this conversation about Boudier or Russell or did you see him? Who looks good? What do you think's wrong with him? All that's happening um, in and around the various aspects of Vegas and what it has to offer. So it's a, it's like the baseball winter meetings, but with action. You know, it's a full convention of the NBA in the summer with real action to take in and evaluate, and uh, it's cool. It's fun. The last question, I'm going to throw this one to Kevin. Kevin, in that same vein, is there any exchange of, you know, philosophy from an analytics standpoint among folks here, whether they are working for teams or not working for teams? Is there any part of that that goes on in summer league? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, I think along with the Sloan Conference, this is kind of one of the two opportunities for analytics people throughout the league and, and again, outside the league as well as with teams to get together in one place. And you're, you're careful about what you want to say, I think, when you're working for a team because everybody views this as proprietary and competitive advantage, but uh, you're still swapping thoughts and, and exchanging ideas, and it's very valuable from that standpoint. And then, you know, for those of us who are in the media and don't have to worry about that, it, it's basically, uh, you know, your Twitter Twitter uh, replies sprung to life where you're carrying out all these basketball debates with everyone, things that people normally in your life probably just don't care about, you know, that the Quincy Miller, Steve Blake trade is not something you probably discuss with your family. But when you get every, all of us basketball nerds together in one place, it's, uh, it's a good time. Absolutely. You know, again, one of the things I like is also the vendors are there. You know, Synergy's here, Second Spectrum. These are companies that maybe the casual fan may not recognize, but they are big players in our industry. Special thanks to Tom Penn, to Kevin Pelton, my comrades in the NBA front office insider group. We are signing off here from sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for listening to the NBA Lockdown Podcast Summer League Special. And make sure you subscribe and get all types of lovely updates throughout the summer. Thanks for listening to NBA Lockdown on ESPN Radio. For more great podcasts, check out the Pod Center page on ESPNRadio.com.